Lauren Bartell and I wanted to just share a little bit about who the Greater Brockton Health Alliance is, a little bit about our journey and how we've gotten to where we are today. So good evening, my name is Hillary Lovell. I work for Signature Healthcare and Community Relations, but I am one of the co-chairs for the Greater Brockton Health Alliance. So we just wanted to share a little bit about our mission and vision. We are a collaboration between community agencies and residents so access to, to access to sustainable resources are available to meet the unique health needs of those who live and work in the communities of the Greater Brockton Health Alliance. Our mission is to work towards healthier communities by promoting collaboration between the Greater Brockton Health Alliance partners, providing support to local health initiatives and programs, education, and increasing awareness of health issues throughout the communities it serves. We wanted to highlight this because we um, really want to build capacity in the various other communities that we serve. So here is a, you know, a, a snapshot of our service area. So as you can see, it covers more than just the Brockton area. It encompasses the Bridgewaters, Stoughton, Whitman, Easton, Avon and Abington, as well as Holbrook. And we have had folks join us over the years and we really hope that we can add um, even more. So for the past year, we've actually been really working hard to refocus our efforts. For quite some time after a needs assessment in 2010 and then in 2013, we identified four focus areas that included oral health, substance use, nutrition and fitness, and now I'm gonna, oh, asthma. <laughs> had to pause for a minute. Um, we really wanted to refocus our efforts to behavioral health. And part of that is because there is a need in the local communities, but we're also working on a regional initiative with two other Chinas, which are Plymouth and the Blue Hills region. And so as a region, we are really focusing on this. And so for the past year, we really held many of our meetings to identify what does behavioral health mean? What is already happening in our communities as it relates to behavioral health? And where are some of the gaps? And so with that being said, one of the speakers who we had this past year was Stephen Nikolsky, who was from South Shore Health System. And he had said that behavioral health is more than mental health and substance use. It is looking at the whole person, where they are, and where and how they can thrive. And so we took a look at that definition and came up with our own as far how the Greater Rockton Health Alliance viewed behavioral health. So we are looking at the whole person in the context of the following areas, including but not limited to social determinants of health, which include education, housing, income and transportation, cultural competencies, early intervention and prevention, and physical and social environment, including stigma and cultural barriers. I'm going to turn it over to Lauren. Hi everybody, I am Lauren Bartell, I'm the co-chair of the Greater Brockton Health Alliance. Um, and as Hillary mentioned, over the past year or so we have been changing our focus. But at the root of everything, we still wanted to follow our guiding principles, which you can see here on the screen. So even though our focus is shifting from, as Hillary said, physical activity, nutrition, asthma, oral health, uh, to behavioral health, we still wanted to make sure that as a group, we were following the same principles that we came together um, many years ago um, and determined. So you can see here diversity awareness, um, collaboration, um, decreasing duplication of services. So we're really trying to get multiple uh, community members involved, make sure that we're continuing to meet the needs um, of our community without really um, working in silos and, and kind of working all over and, and not together. So that's really what the focus is of the Greater Brockton Health Alliance. And we are so happy to see so many new faces. Your input is very much needed. Your support for this important work um, is definitely something that we're looking forward to hearing your voice as time goes on after today's presentation. Um, a few months ago, as we were shifting our focus, um, we wanted to get the voice of our members of the Greater Brockton Health Alliance to see what exactly was the root cause of what we were focusing on. So we worked on an activity um, called the Five Whys, and each table, um, they chose their own sort of um, header of what they were going to work on and what they felt impacted behavioral health. So you can see here, they were categorized into five different areas. We have environmental or living situations, systemic barriers, substance use, individual factors, and societal pressures. These were the sort of categories that the groups that we had um, work on this in their groups uh, that they felt were impacting behavioral health of community members in the greater Brockton area. Now. We had about an hour to do this, and we could have worked on it for 
probably another full two days, um, if not longer, but community health people, we feel like we can save the world in one hour. Um, so the work is still continuing. And I think as the conversations continued, we can see, you know, we know that the social determinants of health are impacting um, all areas of health, including behavioral health. And if you look down at the root of it, especially um, in the world we're living in today, we really had to take a hard look and recognize that um, as a part of that, systemic and institutionalized racism is at the heart of many of the health issues that we're seeing in our communities. So that is why we're here today, to start to address that topic on a deeper level. Um, so as we are uh, listening to Dr. Jethwani speak today, uh, we're very excited to hear what he has to say. I want you all to sort of think, um, what can we do, um, everybody, including you in this room, and the Greater Brockton Health Alliance, to impact the health of our communities through this lens? So try to keep your uh, brainstorming going while we listen, and, and we'll be looking to hear forward to hearing your thoughts as we move forward as a coalition to impact the health of our communities. Before we um, have our speaker to start, I'm going to pass it on to our fellow steering committee colleague, Teresa Alphonse, who will share a spoken word poem with us. But I find talking about social justice really fun um, because I feel like these conversations are very forward thinking. Um, so feel free to um, feel at ease when you're here. Feel free to clap. Who here is ex actually excited to be here? Raise your hand. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so I'm going to perform a poem called Six Skin. It is a poem that I wrote uh, almost three years ago now. I um, performed it at a DPH conference, the Department of Public Health conference on uh, racial justice and health equity. I was a part of a uh, coordinating committee that implemented this conference. And um, racial justice is something that really frames all of the work that I do. I love working in the communities that I work in. I loved growing up in Brockton. Um, I do believe that by attacking racial justice, we're able to dismantle a lot of different systems of oppression um, within our country. So I'm really excited that I could be a part of pioneering a talk such as this. So I'm just going to get right into the poem. In sixth grade, Katie made fun of my braids because my hair didn't grow. In ninth grade, Miss Kelly said I sounded like a monkey speaking Creole. In college, Bridget said she didn't want to go to my events because she was afraid she would be the only white girl. Even though we went to a predominantly white institution and we live in a white world, the older I got, the more I noticed these microaggressions. The older I got, the more I noticed that these small moments and others were current forms of oppression, noticed that my skin put me in certain positions, put me at a predisposition for pretty much anything and everything negative in life. One of my favorite rappers, Andre 3000, said, why across all races do dark people suffer most? This quote constantly replays in my head. I think about how many times my race came into play at night while I lay in bed. I try to let things go, knowing that this anxiety will lead to my demise. Although I hold a master's degree and physically fit and go to my annual doctor's visits, the stress I feel from something so far beyond my control is making me sick. I am black, so no form of prevention can keep me from certain ailments. Because of my skin color, I'm more likely to have higher levels of blood pressure. Because of my skin color, I'm more likely to have a higher body mass index. Two thirds, are le two -thirds of doctors are less likely to spend more time on me and include me in medical decisions. I'm more likely to die from a disease because I do not get adequate treatment. I am more likely to have a baby at a low birth weight. The list goes on. You see, my skin is something that I can't nor do I want to be fixed, but what I'm working on, and hopefully you will too, is how the world looks at it. Shaquana shouldn't have to lie about her name when applying to jobs. Inner city children should have the same education as their suburban white counterparts. I shouldn't have to have the be careful, you're a black man conversation with my cousins, brothers, or unborn sons. When we reach a world that is racially just, all health gaps disappear. Together, we can eliminate the inequities due to race that thrive and live here. Thank you. So
So I'm so delighted to be introducing Dr. Kamal Jethwani. He is a senior director at Partners Connected Health Innovation and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. As a senior director of Connected Health Innovation, Kamal Jethwani leads a multidisciplinary team in creating and validating innovative technology-enabled solutions to reimagine the healthcare experience. Kamal focuses on enabling better care delivery by improving patient engagement, patient provider communication, and patient satisfaction with care using technology-enabled solutions. His work so far has shown that programs that are personalized to each patient's unique psychology and needs forge higher engagement and in turn better outcomes. Kamal continues to develop analytic and programmatic modalities to improve the personalization of connected health. He has worked extensively with sensory technology, wearables and mobile as well as social media. The ability to personalize care and understand behavioral motivations that dictate health choices remains central to all his work at Partner CHI. So I was thinking about how I would describe him, and I was thinking about how I saw Dr. Jethwani present at a conference a few months ago down the Cape. And I was just wrecking my brain trying to think of what I took away from it. Uh, different examples of things that I learned. But all I could focus on was how Dr. Jethwani made me feel. And it made me think about, um, I believe it was Oprah who said this, that uh, people won't always remember what you said, but they'll always remember how they made you feel. And Dr. Jethwani made me feel very included. He made me feel like my story, although we, looking at us, you would see that we probably identify with a, a, a lot of different identities, and you might not think that we're very similar um, on outward, based on outward appearance, but he felt, he made me feel like my voice was being shared and my experience was being shared, and he was relaying that voice and experience to hundreds of people in the room. So after I heard him speak, I rushed to him and I said, thank you, and he also made me feel comfortable. So in our conversation, I felt like it was almost a therapy session in that I was relating things that I had been through in the workplace to the conversation and uh, the talk that he gave. So I want to thank Dr. Jethwani for making me feel and um, feeling good. And I hope that with this presentation, he can make everyone else in the room feel that way. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Kamal Jethwani. Um, Teresa did a wonderful introduction and I hope I can live up to it, so <laughs> I'm actually feeling a lot of pressure right now. But um, what Teresa described about my work is, is one way I identify myself. Um, you know, I, I am a physician and I, I do a lot of innovation work, um, but that's not the only thing that describes me and that defines me, and that my identities are, are different and, and, and all-inclusive. To begin, I identify as a cis man, which means that my gender identity is male. So anyone in the audience who also identifies as male, would you raise your hand? Higher up would be great, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I'm a physician, any physicians in the room? Okay, great, I'm not that alone. Um, I also am an immigrant, I wasn't born in this country. Any immigrants in the room? Woo, all right. <laughs> We're in good company. Um, I also identify as Asian. My racial um, identity is Asian. Any Asians in the room? Okay. A little bit lonely, so hopefully the next one will be a little bit open. Um, I'm also a dancer. Any? Okay. All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, married. Hopefully more company, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I'm doing this in rooms and like four of these are all like, I'm the only one and I'm like, oh, should have picked the right ones. <laughs> um, I also identify as gay, uh, as my sexual identity. Anyone who would share that? Okay, great. Um, and then finally, I don't have any kids. Okay. <laughs> good job, we've made a good decision, <laughs> at least so far. <laughs> So the purpose of this exercise was just uh, to talk a little bit about the fact that identity is not one thing, 
right? And sometimes, predominantly, one of our identities leads us to, to make a lot of life decisions or puts us in a lot of life, life situations, but identity is intersectional, right? What makes me is not the color of my skin or my training as a physician or my identity as a gay man. What makes me is a combination of all those different things. And so my ex life experience is gonna be different from another Asian gay male because I also dance, right? And I also have these other identities that I hold close to my heart. And as we think about identities and we, as we think about race and, and justice and social justice, uh, the one thing that I think is almost really very important is to think about people as intersections of these different identities. No two people are similar. There, there could be people that come very close, but I can guarantee you that I can find things between them that might be different. And that shapes their thinking a little bit more differently. But the opposite of that is also true. And the opposite of that is kinship. You know, when you raised your hands, uh, when, you know, I only had one person in this room that raised their hand for one of my identities, you know, instantly I was connected to that one person in that unique way for those two seconds because we had something in common. And kinship is something that is the basis for finding commonality between each other and, and, and finding common ground and moving up from that. So as we're thinking about our identities and how we think about you know, ourselves and what we hold dear to ourselves, we also wanna think a little bit about the fact that we have commonalities with other people. We may not both have the same skin color, but there are other things that are common between us that, that may give us common ground to stand on. Now, kinship over the years has been used in ways um, to, to take away power from other people as well. The proof in the pudding is, for example, medical education. Uh, what this graph is showing you is um, the hierarchy of medical positions by race. It, how does your race affect whether you are an assistant professor, or an associate professor, or a full professor? And as you can see, the more professors of one race, the more they're pulling others of their own race to become professors. So there is a clustering of Caucasian people in, in those highest echelons because the like are pulling the like, right? The, the, another example is around uh, the representation of race because, in, and this is an example from a workforce uh, in 25 community health centers across uh, Massachusetts. And uh, this was published in 2016, but what you're seeing here is that staffing categories and leadership categories again, get concentrated in the places where there's already concentration of certain race, racial types. So as we're thinking about structural racism, one of the most important things that we sometimes encounter in the work is kinship is important and finding common ground is important, but then how do you break years and decades and centuries of those structures and those kinship relationships that have created some of these problems in the first place? So structural racism, it's a very big word, it's heavy, and in this environment, it's politically loaded. So I wanted to pause and, and get a gauge from people. What do we think about structural racism? What is structural racism? Anyone? Yeah, did, did everyone hear that? The, so the, the, uh, the answer, I think, was the deck is set against you, right? So that there are so certain people and certain organizations that benefit from having certain things structured a certain way compared to other people. Any, any other perspectives? Yeah, I mean, some people believe because we've had a back black president that we're now post-racial. Um, <laughs> not always true. Uh, any... Um, <laughs> it wasn't long enough, right? We need a couple hundred years of that. Um,
takes on a life of its own um, in its own, in um, how we how we all think about who we hire, how we hire, what our qualifications are. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that institutional knowledge has been a huge piece of that. Great. So those are really all great perspectives. And I still haven't come upon a uh, definition of structural racism that I love. So I want to explain structural racism, or what, how I understand it, with three examples. And, and these are three um, commonly researched and commonly understood and commonly uh, agreed on reasons why some of the um, structural racism that we see in today's world exists. So I'll use three examples. The first one is around social segregation. I, I think a lot of us here uh, were born after um, you know, some of the segregation uh, uh, realities were, were, were present in, in our world, in our country here. But um, the, the one of the simplest examples to think about the fact is that um, housing was a very political matter about 100 years ago. Um, I don't know how many people here actually remember what the housing segregation looked like, but there were certain neighborhoods that were considered good neighborhoods. There were certain neighborhoods that were considered bad neighborhoods. And even though overtly, um, uh, the, the, difference, the, the, the differentiation between these neighborhoods based on race had ended from a legal perspective, there were other things that continued to be a problem where uh, people from worse neighborhoods were not able to move into what we call better neighborhoods. There were rules around mortgages. There were rules around how mortgages are given. There were rules around how people were considered or people were judged or evaluated for, for loans and other things that prevented people from moving to better neighborhoods. As wealth rose in the better neighborhoods, people's equity and people's personal wealth grow, grew, people in worse neighborhoods continued to not have that, that level of equity uh, or in their homes and the level of uh, wealth that they were able to build, even though both people must have bought the uh, house at the same time uh, at the same value. Better neighbors rose faster. When you do that and when you have that for three generations, right? just now think about the amount of wealth that, even though two people are starting at the same level, the amount of wealth that is being accumulated by people who are in what we are calling quote unquote good neighborhoods. There's a whole litany of research on, on redlining districts that, has hap that, that is available online if you Google it. Um, and social segregation is considered now one of the most important reasons why structural racism exists in this country. The second one is immigration policies. Um, how many of us remember here um, the immigration policies around uh, Vietnamese immigrants or Japanese internment camps uh, in, in the last century? Um, a lot of those policies till today affect Asian uh, immigrants and affect where they're living, where they're housed, and, and you know, let the, the rise of Chinatowns and, and what's happening with those things. But one of the most important things that actually speaks to me the most, uh, because um, not only am I an immigrant in this country, but my family, uh, my, my grandfather and my grandparents had immigrated from Pakistan to India and lived in refugee camps in India for the longest time. And then my parents sort of uh, you know, left those refugee camps and were first generation Indians. Um, and then I immigrated into this country. And for the longest time, I couldn't understand my grandparents, right? They, I couldn't understand the way they would think, the way they would hoard things, for example. Um, and when I came into this country, the, le the kinds of insecurities that I faced um, immediately made it um, you know, quickly understandable for me where my grandparents were coming from when we were growing up. But inter intergenerational drag basically is when I have lived as a black man, for example, in an unsafe neighborhood, what I pass on to my kids is my institutional knowledge about how to behave, right? How to allow other people to tell me how to live, how to not you know, get into a fight, how to always listen to the police, how to not own firearms, how to keep yourself safe, how to keep yourself out of trouble. It makes me apologetic for my life in this world and no matter how much the world changes from a social or legal perspective, that's what I grew up with and that's what I learned. And there is research now that shows that it takes four generations for the impact of something like, like racism to go away. So we're still living in the second or third generation of that, right? We're still living who, uh, in, 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 at a point where our parents, in, for some of us, you know, could not go to college because of their skin color, right? We're still living in that time. And that's what we have been raised with, and that is what you're gonna see in some of the in, you know, drag, that, the generational drag that carries on.
It's very easy to say, for example, sometimes that, uh, you know, oh, the law changed and the world has changed. But, but this carries through. There was another study that, that again, spoke to me a lot because um, a, a, a small part of my um, forefathers came from, um, you know, were Jewish. Um, that they actually found changes in genetic patterns in uh, kids of uh, survivors of the Holocaust. That you can still genotype them and see changes that aren't apparent in other people. So there's still things in their genotype that have been coded that, that have come from the Holocaust. So all of this is, is one way to say structural racism goes beyond physical structures beyond, for example, things like segregation. It goes beyond mental structures where I'm taught to treat a black person in a different way uh, you know, than, than maybe a white person. It actually, the structures are as deep as, as our genes, right? So now when you think about the life that people are living because of their skin color or because of their immigration status or because of their, their you know, whatever other um, issues, right? Um, it is not dictated just by how the world is manifesting. So I wanted to take three examples, especially in healthcare, where racism has been coded so deeply that it's going to take at least another 100 years for us to correct that. And so just examples of, of what we, I, I, just to have a conversation about examples of what we consider structural racism in, in, in healthcare. So medical research, 96% of the people who have contributed uh, their genome to genetic studies for medications or for any genetic understanding are Caucasian. 96% of our understanding today of genotypes and genes is Caucasian. Only 4% people who have contributed their genotype for any studies across the world today are non-Caucasian. It's easier to find people who are educated for clinical studies and clinical trials. So as a researcher myself, you know, we put ads out um, right away, immediately, I'm alienating people who can't read English right away. It's 25% of the population, right? So there are, there are things like that, again, structural racism, where, where that happens, right? Um, the second thing, oh, sorry, is think about, forget genetics, right? Think about any clinical trial. How many of you have seen ads for clinical trials on the train or in your campus or whatever, right? We, everyone in this room has seen an ad for a clinical trial. You know if you wanted to get part of a clinical trial, you know, you could figure it out and you could go there. African Americans comprise 30% of our population in the US right now, 6% clinical trial patients. Any clinical trial across healthcare are African American. Only 6% in the United States. More than that, Asians, and I'm talking about all Asians, not Indian and not just Chinese, not just Japanese, all Asians. Since 1993, only 2% clinical trial participants have been Asian. So who cares? Why should we care? Yeah, I mean, participation in clinical trials is important, if for only one reason. It's because all of our scientific understanding of healthcare is based on that. Teresa brought up a great point in, in her poetry. But think about it this way. Asthma is a very common condition, especially in people of color. 67 Puerto Ricans and 47 African Americans do not respond to the first line treatment and asthma, albuterol. They do not respond. They're not genetically more likely to have any bad outcomes necessarily. Anyone who tells me that there's a genetic likelihood of someone having, being more sick is lying. Because as we just saw, you know, 96% of the genetic studies are done on, on Caucasians. So we have no understanding of anything else. So anyone that's telling you that African Americans are more likely for X, they're lying. They don't have enough of a sample size <laughs> right away. But think about this example, right? 47% of African Americans do not respond to albuterol, which is the first line of drug, which is the only treatment that's available, uh, or the, one of the only treatments available generic. This is the, one of the only treatments of, available that I give my patients that I know will cost less than $10 copay because anything more complicated is going to be more expensive, right? And this is the drug I always start with and I always want to give it six months because I want to make sure that it, you, know, you, you, uh, you use the drug that's most, uh, most cost efficient. It doesn't work. 
doesn't work. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this, like, but a couple years ago, the state of Hawaii, the attorney general, sued Plavix because Plavix actually does not work in, um, in uh, Pacific Islanders, just does not work. And they were giving ads after ads of Plavix in, in, in Hawaii, and the attorney general sued and said, you're lying, it doesn't work on my people. And they were sued, right? They've stopped advertising in any place now that's uh, predominantly um, Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders. But we don't see that every day. Why is all of this happening? Well, the reason this is happening is because we don't include, we, we, we have systematically excluded our understanding of med medicine because we only do all of our experiments and all of our understanding on Caucasians. So now that that has happened, it's gonna take us years to correct this. Because now think about how many African Americans I need to enroll in a study and study a drug, right, that I'm finally gonna be able to find that works well in them, and then from the day a drug is actually put into the market to the day it actually gets a critical adoption, it's 15 years in healthcare, right? <coughs> from the day of the launch, right? So we're at least 45 years away from finding something that works for any other racial group except Caucasians. That's what's happening when we think about structural racism. Access to care is an important thing, and I, I didn't want to get too much into this because you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole um, body of literature that gets into you know, how different races have different um, access to care or dif differential access to care. But I actually wanted to point out something that one of the most important things is when a person of color walks into a clinic, what are the likelihood that they will be treated by someone in the entire medical staff that looks like them? One in nine African Americans is going to have at least one person in the care team, that includes front desk, that looks like them. One in nine. And we're talking care team, we're not talking physicians because that's a pretty disappointing number. Care team. So think about, from a cultural perspective, how you communicate to this care provider, how you perceive care, how you worry about what you can and can't disclose about your lifestyle, about your diet, about your sexual habits, about your life, you know, about whatever, right? Um, and, and our understanding in healthcare already from a social, from a social and social, psychosocial standpoint is so weak that now you add this other layer of cultural understanding, right? And, and it, just goes, it just goes for a whack. Healthcare staffing and training. This is another interesting one. African Americans are underrepresented, we all know that. I wanted to take a slightly different look uh, because to me, you know, like uh, I'm Asian and I, I have a lived experience of a person of color in this country and, an immigrant, uh, and as an immigrant. So I, get, I gravitate towards research topics like that. So I've done a lot of research, even in, in healthcare technology on, on that, that focus on minorities. So I was like, why aren't African American doctors doing more research? Well, African American researchers are already small. So 3% applicants at NIH are African American but African American researchers are 13% less likely to get funded for the same topic at the same level of seniority compared to their Caucasian peer. So if I, as an African American doctor, has 10 years of training and has come out of the same institution, has the same exact idea as a white person, I'm 13% less likely to get funded for my research. How do we expect to break the barriers and get more interesting topics and more diversity in the topics that we're researching on if we don't encourage research by people of color. Um, the last line got cut, but um, one of the other things in, as we think about healthcare and, and training, at Partners Healthcare we do really, really, and really, really well on, on getting people through the door. So our non-exempt staff, which basically means our hourly staff, which are entry-level staff, we have over 50% people who identify as non-Caucasian. Non Any guesses on what our leadership is comprised of in terms of non-Caucasian? 13% of our leadership is people of color. <coughs> and this is people of color, not African Americans. <laughs> Don't want to go there. 50% or more of our entry-level staff is people of color, and only 13% of our leadership. So there's not a paucity of people, right? Something's going on between that ladder. That's not right. 
So all of this is not new, it's not news. Hopefully this is not news to anyone in the medical field, right? And so people are trying to come up with ways to address this and people are trying to, you know, people mean well, right? And, and I've heard now a lot about the concept of cultural competency. Has anyone heard about competency? Okay. So cultural competency is the ability to interact effectively with other cultures. It's very simple, right? Um, how you get there is a little bit more difficult, but the concept in itself is about effectively, you know, communicating with other people that of different cultures. So you may be, you may think, for example, that you know, um, and this is this is from my own medical training 15 years ago, where we were trained to not ask African American women about the father of their child. We were tra because you know it makes them uncomfortable potentially because we have, we have data to prove that you know, they, they sometimes have, they, they, there's a higher likelihood of having kids without marriage, et cetera. Also, there's data around incarceration of black men. So in, in healthcare we're taught, if it's an African American woman in OBGYN, don't ask about the father because it makes them put them on a back foot. Let's assume that's a good example, right? Let's just for a minute assume that's it. That's an example of cultural competency. It's telling me, here's the things that you think about or you don't think about with certain groups of people. There's research now that shows that organizations that are culturally competent have better health outcomes and um, have increased respect and mutual understanding and, you know, from patients. But cultural competency stops at a point that's very important because it still continues to give the power to me as the person who's interacting with them. So cultural competency has been used across the US a lot and has become something that people a a aspire towards. Um, and there's a now a lot of criticism about the fact that cultural competency is enough. Cultural competency basically says, I'm still in power, but I'm gonna learn how to talk to you. So we thought a lot about this and, and I think people in the social justice space uh, you know, uh, really think about the right words to use. The, the new concept that, that we're hoping that people think about and learn and has been extremely difficult to get into any training is what we call cultural humility. <laughs> right off the bat, the difference to me between humility and, and competency is you're not in power anymore. You don't know what you don't know and you need to let the person who's coming in lead. And that's hard. It's very hard. How many, if, how many people in this room s actually see patients in any capacity, be it social work, clinical? Okay. Would you mind, anyone of you, mind sharing sort of the interactions that you have and, and how many times you see yourself taking lead on what you think the person wants to hear about? And the expert. Yeah. yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was a gr that's a great perspective. So, the one thing that I, I mean, uh, this is a quote from um, from uh, Beth that I really like. When we talk about cross cultural care, it's the culture that we come from and the culture that our patients come from, right? And a true partnership 
is to first acknowledge where I'm coming from, then acknowledge where the person is coming from, and competence, in her words, is an end point where I think, okay, if I'm competent, I've done it, I'm, I've passed my test, done my two hours of training, here I go, versus humility, which is a process and an attitude, right? Where I'm approaching something with an attitude that's never gonna change, and I acknowledge that I'm never gonna learn everything that there is to learn. I will become better at a practice that I'm going to you know, do for the rest of my life. But entering every conversation and every interaction with the humility that I'm not the expert, I'm gonna learn something new here. So there are some things about humility that I love in terms of practice and has shaped not only my own clinical practice but also my practice with my employees and, and how we approach ideas and how we approach people um, whether it's in a, in a professional setting or a personal setting, but most importantly, uh, really thinking about how do we modify clinical practice or how do we modify our, our interaction with our members um, in a way that, that makes it sensible. The other thing I hate is the word patient. Whole other talk, whole other story. We should do it next year. <laughs> but but um, really thinking about how do we shed that image of an expert or, a, some, or someone in a, in a hierarchic, hi hierarchically higher position and, and approach this conversation as equals. So the one most important thing in this is right off the bat, in cultural humility, we talk about acknowledging the person and where they're coming from, but most importantly, that they are the only expert who knows themselves, right? Their authority over their own experience. If they're saying something, then that's their authority. I'm not gonna correct it, I'm not gonna question it, I'm not gonna tell someone race, well, you know, we're living in a post-racial world and that race is a figment of your imagination. Whether I agree with it or not, whether I like it or not, I'm going to acknowledge that they have authority over their experience and I'm going to approach it with that. So there's three things that we talk about that I'm going to go through a little bit rapidly, but there are three things that we talk about in cultural humility. And the first one starts with you yourself. Cultural humility starts with an understanding of yourself and your own and where you're coming from and your own um, evaluation, right? If I'm a white Caucasian male, cultural humility starts with me understanding and acknowledging who I am and where I'm coming from and wh what my perspective might be. I'm college educated potentially, you know, I'm potentially ha if I'm a physician, I'm, I have a medical education. My parents could afford me to, put, to, put, to afford to put me through, through some sort of ed education. I was good enough to at least get certain loans. There was always an expectation that I would go to college because my, my parents themselves probably were educated and at least had a college degree. They had enough stability to provide me with a home and provide me with stability and so on and so on and so forth. When we do cultural humility training in hospitals, it's one of the most emotionally draining days, the first one, because on the first day all we do is have people reflect on their own lives and on their identities and on their privileges, and that's hard. Because unless and until I acknowledge what my privilege is, I don't understand the lack of privilege that someone else might be coming in with. The next one is to fix the power imbalance. So approaching cultural humility or approaching an interaction where right away and right off the bat, because I know myself and I know the person who's walking in, I know that there is a power imbalance, right? I always enter, um, for example, a clinical encounter and I, I say, I am an expert at medical knowledge because I've gone through 12 years of medical training. All I know is how some bodies work, but I don't know how your body works. And I don't know how your, what your body has been through over the last 35 years, and I wanna learn about it. So that I can see if I can even start to apply my medical education to the puzzles of your body. And that changes the conversation. And we, we, we do have longer interactions, but we, that changes the conversation because now the person tells me about things that they would never, never have told me before. And they tell me not just about what's wrong with their body, but what they've done to their body over the years and what they think must have gone through their body. I don't tell them that they're, they're, the, skin of their, the, the color of their skin is contributing to it, right? I don't tell them that, they tell me that or we don't, acknowledge, we don't talk about it, we just talk about the impact that that, that has had on them. Um, and, and the other thing I always say uh, to everyone in, 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 in our medical practice, 
for example, is that our job in, as medical practitioners is yes, we have that, that expertise and we have all of this, but I always approach it as uh, a, a, a person who is trying to investigate something, right? We're investigators. And if I have 80% of my judgments made before I walk into the room, I'm not a very good investigator, right? Um, if I walk into the room and I see someone and I know already by just looking at them what I think their problem is, I'm not a very good investigator. So shedding that, hard, but, but important to do. And then developing partnerships with people and groups who advocate for others. This in medical practice is very, very difficult. When we try to hire people who match our community, uh, the realities of our community, it's hard. It's hard because of systemic issues that prevent such people from coming into careers like this. But what we have done is that we have found resources and we have found groups that our, hosp that our um, health practice relies on to be able to provide that last piece where we want people to be able to advocate for each other and not hold the position of, of being the expert at advocating for everyone and everyone's rights. Because I don't know. I don't know the lives that people lead. Any questions so far? Yeah, so I think um, <laughs> my understanding of the reason they were going there was because it was easier to get larger sample sizes and, I, right. Yes, yes, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll try to paraphrase. Um, I'll try to repeat the question, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but a lot of pharma companies now are going to India and China and, and Pakistan um, and apparently, um, you know, the, the people there are, are more likely to be compliant and, and not report side effects and, and, and have, pharma companies are likely to have more successful trials abroad because there is again that dynamic of power uh, between the people who are really poor and need the money and, and these pharma companies that are willing to do that. So I think the question was, you know, how is that going to impact medical research as we're talking about it? Um, and, you know, how is that going to impact p potentially the quality of the products that are coming out? Because, you know, they'll say, oh, our, our trial was successful. That means that we are doing a good job and this is a good product. So I think the answer to that is the FDA will probably get smart to that once we have a few instances. Sometimes you just need that to boil over, right? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, so th there you go, the, the kinship factor, right? Um, so I, mean, I, I don't, I, I would be lying if I said I knew the answer to that, right? I think um, I have friends who work in developing countries and who are participating in trials um, as, as trial sites. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a quarter of the price in the US, than the U.S. and it's, you know, they can do it much faster because they have more people. That's what I've heard um, so far. From a genetic standpoint, uh, I think it's, it's a welcome change, at least a little bit. It'll, it'll open up some of the genetic variability. Uh, but I don't know if the quality of the trials, whether people are compliant or not, even the quality of the way they're deploying it is, is fairly questionable. So I don't know. I'm, I'm mixed about that. Yep. <coughs> Do you see what I'm saying? It's an excellent example. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's um, 
And then how do we do it even further in 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't fix the latter problem. <laughs> But um, that's such a good example because um, you know, that really talks about the struggle as a practitioner, right? And that the first point that I was trying to make here is understanding yourself and, and who you are, right? But the, the, and, and, and this, won't, this may or may not help, right? But one of the things that um, we all have to get in the practice of doing is to know that in the eight hours that we are practicing medicine in whatever form, whatever training level, it's about the person that is coming in to seek help. It's not about us. Right? It's not about us. It's not about our belief systems. It is not about our identities. It is not about our biases. But it's about them, right? And if we approach it with, with, without saying, why are you doing this to the, to the innocent uh, life, versus what happened to your body, you, you, because you're in control of your body, right? And, and your life, and what do you, where do you need your life and your body to be, and how can I help you get wherever you want to be? What are your goals? And if you are, if you are questioning certain things, and you know, I, I can help you get to the right answers and resources, but how do I make you and help you get your body where you want it to be? Because we are, I mean, I always think about it like, I'm, I'm a robot. I'm a, basically a robot that studied really hard for 12 years, right? <laughs> and I'm supposed to regurgitate information, right? That's literally, technically what I am at that point, right? You know, and how do I not insert everything outside of the 12 years of medical education in my decision making, right? And, and that, that takes time, right? But healthcare, if you think about it, is the only industry in the entire world that doesn't actually care about the consumer, right? We, we, we give people the worst experience on the planet and people just keep coming back to us. <laughs> so when people say healthcare consumers, I always laugh because consumerism implies choice. Healthcare, there's no choice, right? right? And that's right off the bat. Uh, an imbalance in power that we have taken so much advantage of. Like, we should all be out of business. Literally, we should all. If it takes someone 45 minutes on the phone waiting to reach someone to set up an appointment or cancel an appointment, tell me another industry that does that to you and you keep going back. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, so what, what I wanted to end um, with, a f with a couple slides uh, on practicing humility and practicing um, you know, cultural, cultural humility and cu cultural dignity. And, and this is a little bit difficult, um, only because I think it's taken years and years of, of, ins of, of, of training and, and thinking about it and introspection to get to some of these points. Uh, I've, I've borrowed this from a book that I have linked at the end as well. And I, if anyone is interested in this topic, I would encourage people to, uh, to read Dr. Hicks's book uh, on dignity. Uh, but but um, her whole philosophy is around uh, converting the, the racism topic and thinking about dignity. How, how can we pe treat people with dignity? And if we always treat people with dignity, no matter who they are, that we might start to unravel some of these imbalances that have existed in our society. So I'm going to start, first of all, with this. Um, the first uh, step around uh, thinking about dignity is about accepting authentic identity. For me, my personal journey, um, I grew up in India, which is a very, very conservative country. Um, I went to medical school when I was 16. And I, you know, was always, I was the nerd who always studied because I never had friends. And I never had friends because I was a gay boy. And it took me the longest time to be okay with it, right? I, I overcompensated for my lack of social acceptance with um, my love for, for things that will not speak back to me, my books. And, and that's where I grew up. When I, was t when I was 22 and I came to this country, I um, struggled initially, right? I struggled fitting in, I struggled figuring out what's going on. And I was the kind of person that just wanted to fit in because I had not fit in, fitted in for years. And this was my second chance, right? Um, and I worked for about two years really, really hard to fit in. I, I made sure my accent sounded as American as possible. I, you know, gave up my favorite colors and clothes and I started wearing clothes that American people will accept and I started shopping in the US and all of that stuff, right? My house looked like Ikea from the, from the first day. Um, it was perfect. I was getting, I was becoming as American as possible. And, and then one day during residency, um, it just struck me. I don't know what happened that day. I don't remember the actual incidents, but, um, 
I started talking to a patient about my experience of, uh, still at that point, a closeted gay man. And we both cried because he had, it was his 16th time trying to commit suicide. And I was trying, and I was the person on the round at two o'clock at night trying to tell him to not do that. And that being gay was not wrong. And, I'm, and I broke down because I thought that I'm not being authentic. And my journey started with me not caring about what people think and about accepting my own, more, my own authentic identity. Um, today, you know, wh one of the reasons why um, I think I was invited to speak to the other talk, uh, talk as well was I have a team of 50 people out of which at every single level we have 50% diversity. Uh, the only team at Partners that has that and it took me years and years to be able to build that and the reason it, and, and the, my first step with anyone that I either interview or that works with me is that they know everything about me and my identity and I accept my authentic identity and it has taken me that amount of time and energy where I've been able to create a culture where we joke about immigration, we joke about being deported out of the country and we joke about race and we, we talk about it openly and sometimes my staff is like, oh my God, he's gonna pull the race card, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and it's an open conversation and everyone talks about it and that's how we've desensitized it and that's why, how we have now opened it up where we accept each other's authentic identities. And that's really important. And so in each of your, no matter where you are in the organization or what level you are, as you're thinking about accepting other people's authentic identities, start, the work starts with yourself first. So how do you accept your authentic identity? And then how do you invite other people to share their authentic selves with you? Not forcing them to do it but actually inviting them to be able to do it because they see you as an authentic person who's bearing their soul and being vulnerable. So that's the first one where I really feel like the work around dignity and around racism and everything starts with yourself and who you are. Validating others and acknowledging others fully. These points basically go towards the same um, sort of higher level point, which is how do we tell, how do we accept other people, and one of the ways to accept other people is by validating other people, right? Um, by validating that what they bring to the table is, is valuable. Um, we've heard a lot of conversation right now on social media where women talk about mansplaining. Have people heard of this word before? <laughs> yes, okay. And uh, uh, what, what really people are asking for in this is that women are saying, I have ideas, right? And instead of telling me my idea back in a more concise way or basically the same words and owning it, validate that I said it because over the years, like racism, there's structure, there's also structure on sexism and we have perpetuated those. So validating others and validating their presence and validating their contribution is important and I feel like that takes practice. It takes a lot of practice, it's taken me a lot of practice. I also, you know, not. Besides being 12 years in uh, medical school or medical education, I have also spent a lot of time teaching. And so in meetings, my first response is, oh, that's not how it is. I'm gonna pick up the white, you know, the, the, the marker, I'm gonna walk to the whiteboard, I'm gonna start writing it. And what I realized over the years is that by doing that, I occupy a lot of space. Because when I'm doing that, no one else is talking. They're listening to me, seven people in the room listening to me and what I have to say for 10 minutes because I got up and I did that, right? And someone brought that to my attention and I started noticing women don't do that unless asked, at least in my team, right? And so it took me practice, but I stopped doing that. And I said, um, you know, I've started try to, trying to practice how I validate other people's ideas and not summarize it on the board in my own handwriting and make it my idea, but actually sit down and say, can you write that? Or can you explain this better? Because I think I understood it, but I think other people haven't. And, and, and allowing that opportunity, it's very hard. And so um, that's something that again, requires a lot of practice. So when you start at accepting authentic identity about yourself and about others, the next step to think about is giving space and walking away and thinking about how you validate others and acknowledge people's contributions. Um, again, it flows into recognizing and giving credit. One of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, since we're running out of time um, is these last few points. Um, a lot of times we think of ourselves as problem fixers. How many people here sort of have been in some level of position professionally where you've said, I understand your problem, I'm gonna fix it for you. <laughs> and you know why we do that? At least why I do that? 
I do that because I think it's sometimes easier for me to fix it than tell someone else, than, than teach someone how to do it or then let them do it or live with the consequences of their decision, right? Because this puts me in the power position and we've talked about power for the last hour. Um, so one of the things that again, I've trained myself in or trying to get better at, I've never, we'll never reach you know, the, the final points, but um, how do you empower people to make decisions and how do you empower people to act on their own behalf? How do you empower people to become their own champions? Um, believing in, 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 you know, in things that, that other people say and that making sure that you actually think that it matters. Um, and then finally, taking responsibility for action. So the, the whiteboard example I gave you, you know, I, I noticed myself doing that. Someone brought it to my attention. And then I was like, oh my god, I'm the ho most horrible person on the planet. I deserve to die. Um, I want to go and hide under a rock, right? But the next time something like that happened and people automatically expected me to stand up and do it, I, just, I didn't just not do it, but it took me a lot of courage. But I actually acknowledged it. And I said, I'm so sorry. I've been an asshole. I've been occupying a lot of space. I will try to do that less. Please call me out if I do it. And that takes courage. But also, once you do that, then people know that you've given them the opening, right? Now people actually think about that. All men in my department think of that now. All the men will not stand up unless you know, there's no one else in the room or there's no other choice. Because we have now, because I've said that, everyone sort of looks at themselves identifies themselves, thinks about it, and be like, OK, I'm a man too. I'm probably doing that too, and I shouldn't. So that sort of helps create a culture where everyone starts taking responsibility for their own actions. And slowly and steadily, we might start chipping away at the, the decades and the centuries of work that our society has done. I love this quote. <laughs> and that's the reason I put it out here. And, and Donna Hicks is the author of the book as well. But we might not be able to change the world. but Every day, we can try to create it a more respectful way of being in it together. Thank you. I'll open it up to questions. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a, for now, we've structured it to be a two-day training of uh, two full days, it's 16 hours. And, and we go through a series of workshops. Uh, we do a little bit of improv. We loosen, the thing, we loosen things up, we get people into acting, we do role play. Uh, but really, the, uh, the curriculum or the, the, the learning objectives are um, the first half day we spend on introspection and thinking about sort of what we bring to the table, our own identities. We do a number of workshops around that, like really tr uh, pushing people to think about who they are and what they bring to the table. Uh, we then do some role play around um, you know, letting other people take lead. So we have some actors that come in and that, that have scenarios, and you're supposed to be able to go and investigate it and get, them out, get it out of them. Uh, and we make it really, really easy for you to trip on it, because we'll make it you know, African-American woman who's pregnant. And like all my nurses right away snap into action, and they're like, all right, I'm not going to ask about marriage. I'm not going to ask about husband. And like, you know, there's, there's just things like that that we have to break. Um, and then the second day, we go through um, the goals of the organization that's called us to do the training, right? So health practice, health centers have a different goal. Um, some other department, we've done this with IT departments, we've done this with community health centers, we've done this with um, you know, innovation groups, we've done this with startups. So all of them have their own different goals. And so the second day is more tailored to what your uh, employees' own sort of day-to-day -day work is and where you want them to be. So for example, with IT groups, we did training around phone calls and, and tech support and how to, best tech, you know, do, do, how, how to best be humble on the phone. And that's a very different training than what a clinician might need or what a startup CEO might need who's trying to avoid the next big uh, you know, press tobacco. <laughs> but happy to talk to you more about it. And Absolutely. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, um, I actually, my original talk is all about um, how, to, how to improve diversity in your own organization. Um, and at Partners, what we're doing, uh, we are um, thinking a lot about diversity and inclusion in two different ways. And they're different things, and most organizations try to club it together. Not a good idea. Diversity, uh, we're thinking very specifically about, in the diversity thing, about how to think about uh, improving the pipelines 
Um, so if you only have 10% peop uh, people, 10% of your applicants are African-American, there's only a 10% likelihood you're gonna get an African-American employee. Um, so how do you widen the pipeline and how do you get people in? So we're, for example, building uh, relationships with community organizations to make sure that, for, for example, all of our jobs get posted across community organizations, not just on Monster and LinkedIn. Uh, so there's a pipeline piece that we do a lot about. Then we're, do, we're creating metrics and we're creating systems to monitor what happens once you do come into the pipeline. So once you've applied, to the point where you, you got the job, there's a lot of breakpoints, right? And we're monitoring at, across all those breakpoints where we might be losing people. But this, is, this pipeline solution is the last part of our diversity strategy. I think two of the most important things we're doing right now in terms of diversity is one is internships. So getting into schools and organizations early and bringing kids who might be in their first year of training or second year of training and having them do two to three month internships in our hospitals. Uh, and that's one of the best ways to build capacity because these kids don't get opportunities and their CVs don't look good when time comes to apply for jobs. So we have partnerships now with Bridgewater, we have partnerships with, um, with uh, Northeastern, we have partnerships with Suffolk. A lot of these universities we get internships. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing we do a lot is um, there uh, a lot of outreach in terms of uh, trainings to community health, health organizations. So for example, our IT department, our partners, has now started a 40-hour training um, at, a YMCA, at two YMCAs in the Boston area. So we go in, it's a 40-hour IT training. We're just teaching you entry-level skills like tech support, and kids from that community will come in and, and sort of participate with us. Uh, and our internship programs go down all the way to, high, uh, to middle school. So we're training people from middle school all the way to end of college and doing internships. And that, that I think is one of the most important tools that we're thinking about in terms of diversity. Inclusion, which is now that you're here, how can we help you stay? And how can we actually build a pipeline for leaders so that we address that whole mismatch? Um, and in that, we're doing a very structured leadership development programs. So specifically, you know, we're saying 50% of people in leadership development should be people of color, for example, um, and training them up to, to be able to take roles as those roles become available. That's, that's one thing we're doing in inclusion. The second thing is rewarding people in ways that actually uh, work. Um, you know, so bonuses don't work for everyone and may not be the most important thing for everyone. Um, so really actually thinking about our benefits package and thinking about our rewards in a way that's culturally humble, not competent. Um, for, so for example, we found um, in, in looking at our um, community health centers that we were losing women of color between the ages of 30 and 40. And we were just losing them. And we didn't know why we were losing them. Um, and we found that one of the most important reasons we were losing them was because the three months maternity care that we were giving them or the time off we were giving them was not enough. When they came back to work, they were still in entry level jobs, they weren't getting paid enough to afford childcare, and they would eventually make the decision to sit at home or to be able to do other jobs that were you know, more flexible than the jobs we were giving them. So we asked them and we said, what if we give you benefits instead of doing three months maternity, what if we gave you two months maternity and then took their last month and spread it across nine months for childcare? And as soon as we did that, we saw that our women started staying with us. So thinking about culturally humble ways to even shape your benefits package is an inclusion um, example. Yep. <laughs> Prejudice, yep. Yeah. 
I couldn't agree more. <laughs> that, that, that does occur, but, but remember, 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 that occurs because we're taught to think about ourselves in a certain way, right? That, that's our upbringing, and that's our training from years and years and maybe centuries of oppression, because that's how we think about ourselves. We think about ourselves as not good enough, and then we, we see someone else like us do something that we don't think, that either we think that you know, we weren't good enough to do, or that, you know, that we are taught as general not, we're not good enough to do, we feel resentful and, and we try to, try to balance that equation because it's, it's a power struggle, right? Now, so, somehow you broke the, seal, the glass ceiling that I couldn't break, right? But a lot of it is internalized uh, phobias that we have with ourselves, right? Like in, in the gay culture, there's a lot of internalized homophobia, right? I would bet you any money if we had a candidate who was gay who stood up for president, the gays won't work, vote for him. Absolutely, right? Like there's, there's a lot of this, the, these sort of phobias that, that we build because we've built that identity and we've built that, right? Um, how do you counter that? It's no easy answer. Not gonna happen in this generation probably, right? Uh, but we can start with ourselves, right? And, and so the next time we feel resentful about someone getting a job, we think about you know, testing ourselves and thinking about why we're thinking like that. And if enough of us do that, maybe, maybe that'll change. The other, ex the other counterpoint I want to give about that is um, HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review, recently did a study uh, where they looked at managers of color and white managers. And they looked at whether managers of color were promoting or hiring more people of color. And actually that's true. So statistically significantly, higher number of people of color get hired if your manager is a person of color. Then they took a smaller sample size and they looked at managers, both of color and white managers, that both hired the same number of people of color, right? And they looked at those managers' growth trajectories. And they found that white people did not have a change in their career tra trajectory, whether they hired more people of color or not. But colored people of managers uh, actually had, were punished organizationally for hiring more people of color because they were seen as favoring people like themselves. <laughs> and so there's, there's all, all this organizational science and thinking that has to go behind how do we encourage the right behaviors without putting that fear in those managers to say, oh, I should just hire a, a few more white people just so that you know, I, don't, I don't get punished, right? Like that, that feels. So, so there's a lot of these barriers that exist in, in our society that, that we're not gonna change in a day, right? But, but, I, but I think, Again, the only thing we can do is start with ourselves and see where, where we can go. I guess I'm glad you spoke about the illusion of inclusion. <laughs> um, and that's our, our biggest fear, especially as a woman of color. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad that you guys are working on that because that's really huge, especially if we look at people of color with other people of color, yep. we'll, we'll call them names yep. um, because they're being favored, yep. so-called favored. Um, it, it, as, you, as you spoke, it, it stems from a hundred years of, or, or more, or hundred years <laughs> of oppression, but I, I'm glad that, that you have brought this here. Um, I guess it's more of a comment, but um, I, I hope that we see you more. And um, and I really enjoyed it because I I was I was skeptical <laughs> to be honest in a way you know it's, yeah. yeah it is you know it is what it is but I'm I'm glad that you know this is this is being brought out and this is a good way because I do believe in self reflection I do believe in that um, and, it, and and things have to change thank you thank you for the comment thank you. yeah thank you. <laughs> I work in Rockford. Okay. Thank you. Yes. In the last Harvard study you cited
and you said there were white managers and black managers hiring, and you said the black managers were punished when they hired more uh, diverse people. How were they punished? So they looked at career trajectories, they looked at promotions and the number of years it takes for promotions, they looked at whether those managers stayed with the organization or not. Um, so there were a number of different factors. And it wasn't just black managers, it was, it was managers of color. So they just basically said white or non-white. So that was the study. Um, and, and you know, again, um, I see that sometimes with myself, right? When I go into the organization and I'm talking about, oh yeah, my team is really diverse, you know, half of them actually are like, well, you know, you're attracting your own kind, right? Um, and, and so, you know, what I do is I, I acknowledge that right away. And I'm like, yep, that's really important to me. It's, it's, it's very important to me that my team be diverse because actually if you think about innovation work, you know, you're thinking about diversity of ideas, right? And I can't have diversity of ideas and come up with really novel things if I have people who are thinking exactly the same way they've been thinking for the last 200 years. So, but um, punishment, um, at least in that study, was measured around um, time taken to go higher up in the organization. Yes. I, I appreciate the way you talk about how we might get to the heart of some of this stuff. And it sounds to me like there's a lot of communication and trying to be honest about where we've come from. I think about being raised with a ton of prejudices. I think about the, the challenges that even well-meaning people um, just engaged in behavior when I was saying, growing up thinking, okay, well, I'm not there, I'm, I'm behind it. I feel almost like it's going to take much more than four generations based <laughs> on some of what we're seeing, even some reversals these days where I think the mean-spiritedness in the world and the, the demonization of, of immigrants and, and, and it's just, it's frightening to be honest with you. And, and I, on one level, I wonder you know, we're always talking about, well, how do people of diverse backgrounds access services? How do they get what they need without all these barriers? And I'm thinking, yeah, but it's, it's often the, the white folks who, males who are driving the bus, and then you're trying to talk to them about things, and you can't help but get a, a, an unhealthy dose of defensiveness. Yep. And, and how, you know, how do you get to the heart of things without just kicking off another round, and yet we're not supposed to be walking on eggshells, that's part of the problem. Yep. You know, that there's been so much of this just kowtowing, and, and so I often feel very overwhelmed. I know where we need to go. I, I sadly think that it's not just the medical profession, having been in the human services, I, I see the, the, the power issues, I see the, the lack of identification of, of people, of, of not starting with the idea that, listen, I don't know what your issues are, you need to tell me, mm -hmm. so that I can at least understand to the best of my ability, rather than like, like you said, me, you know, me trying to tell you what the solution is, you know, if I, like I had a clue. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is we often don't. I think that acknowledgement, I love the idea of humility being what might drive it. You know, it's kind of like that paradox of humility might be the one thing that overcomes all this craziness. You know, but, but I thank you for, for no. what you presented. Here. Thank you. And, and I agree with, with you about sort of getting overwhelmed. I mean, I think it's a, it's a huge problem. And the more you peel the onion, the more th it just comes out. Um, the one thing I've realized um, is the most difficult thing that, that you, it's the most difficult thing, but it's the, the, the most important first step is to make this conversation a non-issue, right? To wherever you go and whatever you do, to make this conversation enable it, right? but also make it a non-issue, don't make it the elephant in the room, right? That once people start feeling comfortable talking about race, talking about the impact of race, and then talking, like opening up that dialogue, I feel like even if the dialogue is not great, it's a start. I think we often, at least in healthcare right now, people are walking on eggshells all the time, you know, where a nurse is like, you know, um, you know, should we call them black, should we call them African-American? And I'm like, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about why, where did black come from? Where did African-American come from? Do you think all black people are African-American? Do you know about the existence of other black people? Like, let's talk about it without any blame, right? And this is not a difficult question to answer, it's logical. And, and I feel often that as soon as the conversation opens, it's horrible at the first time, so you have to be, you have to be okay putting up with that. But then, you know, people start getting disarmed and start thinking that this is not a bad thing, right? You know, like uh, the Cape Cod presentation you mentioned, right? Um, I think it was an audience of 150 people with like literally like probably 10 people of color. <laughs> and, 
And I did this for 45 minutes with a, with a room full of white people. And it, there were parts of it that were really uncomfortable, but that, that conversation was important to have. And I feel like what I at least do is, you know, I, I open it every time, everywhere you go. It's super uncomfortable, but let's do, let's do that. If all of us made this conversation easier to have, we would talk more about it. And I think if we talk more about it, logic will prevail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much.